Let's get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Cafe Ole. My name is Jay. I'm a volunteer with Nefesh Benefesh. I myself made Aliyah with them just over 15 years ago. And here at Cafe Ole, we go over the everyday Hebrew you need here in Israel to succeed, whether that's reading your bills and learning how to pay them, uh, going grocery shopping and reading nutritional labels, keeping up with the news in Hebrew, striking up a conversation, how to flirt, how to go out on date, everything that you would do in your normal lives in your respective countries of origin, but here in Israel and in Hebrew. Um, as always, we want to hear from you what topics you'd like us to cover. If you have any topics, um, specific ones, please write to us either in the chat box here on Zoom or um, contact Nefesh Benefesh directly, and we'll be happy to look at them. And also, all of our previous lessons are up on YouTube. Just type in Cafe Ole or Nefesh Benefesh. You'll see a whole playlist of all of our previous sessions. This one will go up in the next day or two. So today's lesson. Today's lesson. So last week, we got started again um, in our summer session here, and we both talked about Yom HaZikaron and Yom Atzmut, um, as well as celebrated. Uh, this week is actually um, another important holiday or celebration, as it were, here in Israel, which is Eurovision. Um, for my fellow Americans here in the audience, you have some cultural learning to, to do fast about what is Eurovision. In Israel, we take these things seriously, or even though this year our contestant isn't great. Um, and even though we're part of the European Broadcasting Union, because for obviously many decades, we couldn't be part of regional associations here in the Middle East, we take it very seriously. Um, Israel's won four times in Eurovision. Um, some of Israel's biggest musicians and singers have performed in it. Um, this year, our entry is not slated to do quite well, but we'll still all be watching patriotically. But it brings up an important topic, which is just like we talked about Independence Day last week and talking about a little, well, mentioning Eurovision is um, international. How do we talk about the world in Hebrew? Um, we're so focused on talking about Israel, but how do we talk about the rest of the world in Hebrew? And that's very important because that's one of the major things that Zionism gave us and the state of Israel has given us is that we can be a nation state like the rest of the world. And so if we're going to operate like the rest of the world on the international level, how do we do that? And how do we describe doing that in Hebrew? So we're going to go through some of the big topics. Um, you may know some of these words, so it'll be a great review for some of you. Some of you may have no idea. And we're also going to do something that's no less important. We're going to go over those countries and cities that have unique names in Hebrew. Just like in English, think about some of the countries that you know off the top of your head um, versus how we say it in English versus how they say it in their native language. Um, classic one, Germany. Right? In English, we say Germany. In German, they say Deutschland. Two different words to describe the same place. Hebrew, while there aren't so many, there are some really important ones. So if you want to travel and to be a good Israeli or to be part of Israeli culture also means to always have that travel bug. And Israelis love to travel. If you've ever been in the airport here, you know that to be true. Um, it's good to know what to look for when you're looking for certain destinations. So let's get started. One last piece of housekeeping. If you have any questions about what I'm going through today, please write that in the Q&A box. Any requests, comments, criticisms, compliments, please keep that to the chat. I'm only going to be looking at the Q&A. Let's get started with today's vocab list. So as always, Hebrew is in the middle with the dots and bars that indicate vowel sounds. In Hebrew, we call nikud. Transliteration on the right. English on the left, let's get started. So like I said, we're talking nations, international, the world today. Not words that you can necessarily so easily find, right? So I didn't put on things here like land or continent or ocean. You can look those words up. We're gonna do things a little bit more intricate, but words that you're gonna use all the time. So first, nation. Nation obviously isn't the same as a country and it isn't the same as the land. Um, and for us in Israel, we take this word also very seriously, just like you do in many other countries where your identity is also your nationality and your nationality is part of your identity and it's all interwoven in a very complex way oftentimes. So the word is le'um or uma. Either word means nation. And nation can be described however you want. Um, this is the modern word that we use. Those of you who come from a uh, more uh, 
background with Jewish tradition, you know the word um. Um in modern Hebrew normally gets translated to people. Now, people and nation in Hebrew and in Jewish tradition are very similar, if not um, synonyms of each other. But for our sake, when we're using the word nation to describe other nations, this is the word that we're using, le'um or uma. Okay, from this, we get some very important adjectives. First one is national, right? So if I want to say the national anthem, himnon, is anthem sounds like the word hymn because it is um, a loan word from other languages so himnon leumi national is leumi we simply added a yud to the end of that word leom to create leumi leumi means national those of you who have a bank account at bank leumi now you know what it means national bank okay simple as that how do we say international? Well, just like the word in English is inter, the adjective, the, excuse me, the prefix inter, which means between two different things, and national. So we did the same exact thing in Hebrew. Ben means between. So ben leumi. And you will actually see in Hebrew many places, although you'll see the word ben leumi, like bank ben leumi, international bank, as opposed to the national bank, um, which don't really have that kind of difference anymore, by the way, in modern Israel. Um, you'll also see it written both as one word, as you see here in parentheses, but also with a hyphen. Okay, because remember, ben leumi is taking the original English, international, and making it Hebrew specific. But this isn't something you see all the time in Hebrew, where, where we have this notion of taking a prefix and a whole way of constructing words from another language and putting in here. So to emphasize that we're talking about something, it's a little bit of a loan word here, you're going to see this dash or a hyphen, oftentimes when people are writing bain le'umi. Either uh, spelling is completely all right, but just know they mean the exact same thing, international. Okay. Cooperation. Very important word, whether it's in the region, whether it's between people, whether it's internationally. Shituf peula. Right? This is a very important word we use a lot in everyday Hebrew. Shituf peula. Whether it actually happens or not, it's a different story. Shituf means um, to share. Lishatef is to share something. Shituf is sharing, the act of sharing. And peula is an activity or action. So you put these two words together, sharing and action, participating in an action together, cooperation. This is how we say cooperation in Hebrew, shituf pula. You have to use both words. It's a compound noun in Hebrew. Diplomacy, we have yet to come up with our own word for it. There is the um, word medinaut, which comes from the word medina, state. But this is the word you're going to see most often for diplomacy, diplomatia. Um, it's just one of those loan words we, we use and can't yet shake off. Not that we're necessarily looking to do that. Foreign relations. This is a good one to know. Kishrei chutz. Remember last week we talked about secretaries when we were talking about the root zain chaf resh, and we talked about the word mazkir, and mazkira means secretary. And in those countries where the foreign minister is also called the secretary of state, or instead is called the secretary of state or the foreign secretary, this is where um, this word comes in, chutz. Chutz means outside. Okay, bachutz simply means outside. But chutz, when we're using it here, it means foreign. So maskil chutz is the foreign um, secretary. Or the secretary of state, as we would say um, for Americans, maskil medina. But in the UK, for example, Maskira Chutz, the um, foreign secretary, or Maskirata Chutz, because it's a female right now. Okay, foreign relations is Kishrei Chutz. Kesher is a connection or a relation. Kishrei Chutz, the relations of foreign, the outside relations, you could think of it as. Okay, and you'll often hear it as well as see it abbreviated as Kashach. Kashach is a, um, also a unit in the IDF, in Sahal, that many um, people ascribe to, aspire to be in. That's where you're doing international um, relations with other armies and militaries around the world, as well as their governments. Um, it usually requires a higher level of education, knowing other languages. It's something that's um, 
looked on. And it's also part of other companies and organizations. They'll simply call it Kashach or Kishrei Chutz, the longer unabbreviated form. Another word that gets really, it, it's very similar to Kishrei Chutz, but you're going to hear this word a lot as well, is Yachasim Ben Lumi. Yachasim ben lumim. Yachas is again relation. It's a different word, but it's a synonym for relation. Ben lumi, we already said. International, so put it together, international relations. This is a more literal translation of the English trans, uh, international relations. And this one is also um, abbreviated. We've talked about abbreviations before. We love doing that in Hebrew. We love to keep words as short as possible. So when we can... Um, uh, condense, especially long, multi-syllabic words like yachasim ben lumim into one, we do it. So this one is yachbal. Yachbal, um, this is something that you go to university to study. So if you have um, a child or a grandchild or you yourself are looking to study at university in Israel and you would study what we would call in other countries IR, international relations, here you would call it instead of IR, yachbal. Same thing, just different language. Okay, Misrad um, Achutz is how we say foreign um, uh, uh, foreign ministry here in Israel, foreign affairs ministry. Misrad Achutz, we've had that word Achutz before. And to get into Misrad Achutz, you need to pass what we call course at Soarim. Most countries have something similar. This is the cadets course. Soar, you see the second word here in row nine. Soar comes from the same word, root as Tsair. Tsair or Tsair, depending on how you say the letter, Resh is a young person. And that's the idea here. Kurs Tsorim, Kurs, Kurs Tsorim Cadets, right? Someone at a lower level or entry level who needs to go through a stage, a process in order to become a part of something. So Kurs Tsorim, the Cadets course. That is an annual um, uh, entry point that Misrada Chutz, that the foreign ministry has, if you want to join as both a diplomat as well as a um, um, civil servant in the foreign ministry, uh, they open that up usually at the beginning of each year. Um, and obviously very important if you're interested in these types of things. Another important word, you've probably heard this word lots and lots and lots before, but now we're going to go through it again. Masau Matan. Masao matan is how we say negotiations in Hebrew, okay? This is an interesting word because as opposed to the English where it's one word and it can be negotiation or negotiations, in Hebrew, it's only masao matan. That's both singular and plural, okay? And it comes from the verbs laset and latet, okay? Laset, to carry, to carry forth, and latet, to give. The idea being in negotiations, in good negotiations, you are going back and forth between the various sides of their interests and the other side's interests in order to get to a um, agreement, right? So negotiations, masao matan. You'll often also see this abbreviated, and let me see if I can do it real fast here. If you're reading the news, it's going to look like that. Okay, we don't pronounce this as a single word, but we just say masao matan. When you see this abbreviation, mem vav mem, it stands almost all the time for masao matan. Obviously, in Israel, in Israeli history, that's a very important word to know. Um, it comes up quite a bit. It's a good one to know. Okay, a little bit more of these terms. Let me just pull this down a bit. Okay, shagrir and shagrira. Shagrir and Shagrira, not the easiest words to say, um, are ambassador. Shagrir is a male ambassador, Shagrira, female ambassador. Um, this comes from the same root as the verb lishagir, lishagir, which means to send something. Um, and this is exactly that. Ambassador is the highest level of a diplomat posted to another country. This is the word that we use in Hebrew. The next word is obviously related to them, Shagrirut. Okay, just as a shagril is an ambassador, the shagrirut is the embassy. Okay, the embassy, those of you who also need a crash course in international relations, is the main post of a given country in another country's land. So for Israel, the main one is in Washington, D.C., just like the main, the shagrirut Israel, the embassy of Israel in 
France is in Paris, right? It's usually in its capital city. That's the most important of its um, diplomatic offices in a given country. The next thing below that is a consulia. This one's pretty easy because it sounds like the English is consulate, right? So lest you be confused, especially those of you who are from the New York metro area, what you have in New York, for example, is a consulia, not a chagrirut. You have a chagrirut, an embassy to the um, we're going to get to that word in a second, but not um, for consular services and everything else. You have a New York consulate and you have a DC-based embassy. Same thing in many other countries. A consulate is a smaller posting, usually in a very popular country or in a country that has a lot of of its um, diaspora population spread out. Okay, two different words. They're all interrelated with one another. It's okay if you trip up with all of them, especially because Shagrirut is not the easiest word to say, whether you can say Resh or not. Um, most people will just say Consulia because they just get too um, uh, flustered with saying it, but just know these words mean uh, the various things. Shagrir, Shagrirut, Consulia. Everyone else in that who's posted there as a diplomat will simply be called a diplomat. We have other words, right? We have netzigut, representation, uh, mishlachat, delegation, um, but you can always just stick with diplomat, that nice cognate of diplomat. We've talked about this before when we talked about um, non-gendered communication, but it's worth here stopping and um, getting into something very important when we get into um, nationalities. Um, and I'm gonna give some examples as we go, is that in Hebrew, we not, we're not just very conservative about the amount of syllables that we have, we are very conservative about the total amount of words we have. Hebrew does not have a huge vocabulary. What we have is a very flexible way to create new words. And we've talked about this many times before, and we'll talk about it again in the future, because it's a really important and easy way to understand Hebrew that you can basically create new words out of existing words. One example is that you can create an adjective from basically any noun, right? Just like you can in English, where you add ish or ease or esk or, um, any of those things to the end of a word and you understand you're trying to make an adjective, we can do that in Hebrew with a little bit more um, regularity. We have three different endings, three different suffixes that we attach to a noun to create an adjective. Um, and each of them have a slightly different meaning and their meanings are different enough that you can pretty much tell what they're talking about pretty fast. Let me give some examples. Um, our first one here is the ending I, or ait. Okay, listen to that very carefully. I or ait. When you hear that at the end of a word or you see it spelled and it will typically be an aleph yud for a masculine word or aleph yud taf for a feminine word, it's an adjective for a person's profession. The classic one you've probably come across before, and let me add it here is the word, oh, sorry, that didn't go through. Let's put that here. And in Hebrew would be great. Come on, Hebrew. There we go. There's the keyboard working. Okay. Last. E Nine. Okay, here, row 15, here's an example of I and it at the end of the word. Itonai. Itonai, male, itonait, female, is a journalist. How do we get this word? It comes from the word iton. Iton is the modern Hebrew word for newspaper. It itself is an invention of a word because Newspapers didn't exist in biblical or medieval uh, times. Um, it comes from the word et, which means time. Iton is a newspaper. Itonai is a journalist, someone who writes for a newspaper. Okay, so that I at the end of the word indicates we're talking about someone and we're talking about the profession. There are many other words like this. So just know when you hear that I at the end of a word is talking about the profession. That's one example. Now we're going to get into adjectives for people 
and for ob objects. We've talked about this before, right? The difference between Rusit and Rusia, or Gilmanit and Gilmania, or Anglit and Anglia. Um, it's the same thing here. So for example, adjective for a person. Um, I actually flip these around. Sorry, just one second, lest you get confused. There we go. Okay, let's take the word, since I'm speaking in it. It'll let me, there we go. Um, delete. Okay, anglit. Anglit, with that it at the end of it, indicates number one, it's feminine, and it indicates it's an object. So it can be referring to the English language, hasafa anglit, the English language, or it can be referring to something that is English in origin, something. That's an important distinction. So for example, um, English literature. Okay, it could both be the language, the language is in English, or it derives from England. But the point is that it at the end of the word indicates a object. Okay, a non-human, a non-person. Make it also very clear there. Okay, if I want to say an English woman, then I would take our next word here. Okay, you see this next one here. Um, if e and eat at the other end of the word indicate an object, e masculine, eat feminine, e masculine, ia feminine at the end of the word indicates a person. So if I said or wrote Anglia. Isha Anglia, Isha Anglia is a female woman, is an English woman. Okay? Isha Anglia, English woman. But Safrut Anglit, English literature. Okay? That's an important distinction. Unfortunately, for um, beginner level Hebrew, you're only going to hear in the feminine. It for an object, Ia for a woman. In um, for masculine words, it's going to be the same ending of e, but know that we have three different ways to indicate and talk about a person based on their attributes. And we're talking here about nations and international and descriptions of those levels. So that's really important here. I for a person's profession, e or eat for an object, and e or ia for a person. These are all different objects. Now you uh, adjectives. Now you will hear some. Um, country names, some nationalities end with I. That's more of a grammatical thing than a um, uh, than all of these. So for example, someone who is from Argentina, right? Someone who's from Argentina in Hebrew, Argentinai, right? It should be Argentini, but we say Argentinai. There are only a few of these don't worry if you get them messed up. It's quite all right, but just know by and large, 95% of the time, I, I eat at the end of the uh, word indicates an adjective for a person's profession. E or eat, depending on gender at the end of a word, is um, an adjective for an object. And E or ia, based on their, um, uh, based on gender, is an adjective of an actual person, usually their nationality. Right, Rusi, Rusia, Angli, Anglia, Germani, Germania, Tsalfati, Tsalfatia. All of those indicate a person's nationality versus E or Eat, which is an object. Something is French, something is German, something is Russian. Okay, now we're going to get into some country specific names, both big ones, some of these you may know before. Um, we're going to get into ones that don't translate um, literally. And this is what I was talking about beginning. There's um, some very 
I wouldn't say fancy words, but in English, we call these endonyms and exonyms. How, what language we use to talk about another country, is it in their language or is it in ours? So for example, United States of America. In Hebrew, we do not say United States of America. Obviously, people will talk like that. But when we're referring formally to the United States of America, or we're booking a trip to the USA, or we're reading about it in the newspaper, you're not going to see a transliteration in Hebrew letters of United States. Again, people may talk like that, but that's not the word that we use in Hebrew to describe, to use United States. Instead, many of you know this already, we say this, row 21, Arzot Habrit. Arzot Habrit. Arzot Habrit stands for Eretz. Eretz is land or country. In this case, Arzot, so in the plural, the lands or countries. Habrit. Brit, covenant. So literally lands of the covenant is when Hebrew was being um, uh, uh, revised in the late 19th and 20th century. This is the term that was created to describe the United States of America, because what is the United States of America? Republic of various states put together. So Tablit, the unity, the, um, the covenant of the lands, of the states. Okay, Arzot Habrit. This is how we say it. Sometimes you'll see America. This is the proper formal term for it, just like USA is the proper formal term, United States of America for America, and America is not. Remember, there's North and South America. Many of those other countries would not be happy if you just called one of them America, but that's your prerogative. Um, and in parentheses, it's how it's abbreviated often. So if you are, for example, booking a trip, or more importantly, because you're normally booking trips in your native language, if you're buying health insurance as an Israeli citizen through your Kupat Cholim, which is how most of us travel when we travel abroad, you're going to need to write your Ya'ad, right? You're going to need to pick your destination. And it's not going to have it written in English. It's going to be in Hebrew. And Arzot Abrit is what you're going to look for if you are looking, going to the United States. Okay, so that's really important. Um, and we're going to get into even more of these, but just some big ones right now. And then we're going to get to some very um, unique names in a second. Brita Muatzot. This is important, even though it no longer exists, because not only are we talking about it still in the news today, but we have many Olim, Israeli immigrant, immigrants to Israel, who come from Brita Muatzot. Brita Muatzot, the USSR. Same idea in creating Arzot Brit to describe USA. Brit Hamuatzot is USSR. Brit, union, covenant. Muatza. A Muatza is a council, right? A council, Soviet. So the union of Soviets, the union of councils, Brit Hamuatzot. This is how the USSR is formally known in Hebrew. Again, it's not going to be written USSR or even the longer term or even in Russian. It's going to be written Brita Muatzot. UK. I know we have quite a number of um, UK residents and immigrants from the UK here on the line. We're going to get to how tricky that is in Hebrew in a little bit. But first, if you are simply saying the United Kingdom, making it easy on yourself, Hamamlacha hameuchedet. And we're going to get to actually, this is more tricky in Hebrew in a second, but just know this one is easy. This one is a literal translation of the English, right? Hamamlacha, mamlacha is a kingdom, right? It has the same words as melech and malka in there. Mamlacha is a kingdom. Meuchad is united. So now it's just conjugated for the feminine because mamlacha, kingdom, is feminine. Hamamlacha hameuchedet, the united kingdom. Okay, and when we say this in Hebrew, by the way, we're only referring to the UK. Even if there are other countries that have a formalized name that include the United Kingdom in it, we're only referring to the UK. This one you've probably heard as um, or just seen abbreviated like it is in the parentheses um, um or the slang term we've talked about many um, in our winter session, um shmum. This is how we say the UN in Hebrew. Ha'umot ha'me'uchadot. Remember we had at the beginning of this lesson the word umma as a synonym for le'om, right? Nation is umma. 
Me'uchad, me'uchad is united, just like we just said with Amamlacha um, Me'uchadet. So Ha'umot Me'uchadot, the United Nations is the United Nations, it's the UN. That's how we say it in Hebrew, or it's just simply abbreviated as Um, and said Um. Okay, and finally, this one is also a nice, easy one to um, remember because it's a literal translation and we're talking about Eurovision this week. So this is obviously very important as the European Broadcasting Union is part of the EU, although Israel is not part of the EU. It's nice and complicated like that. Ha ichud ha Europi. Okay, ichud Union, Europi, European. So the European Union, ha ichud ha Europi. Okay. Now, let's get into some um, specific country names and also city names. And why is this important? We are a young country, but we are a very old nation. And we've been around for a long time. And we've seen nations and empires rise and fall for thousands of years. And throughout all of our time, both living in the land of Israel and also in diaspora, we have had to encounter and deal with these many nations and empires. And as a result, we have, for some of them, unique names to them, or they're different enough from the English or from the endonym, the language in which they speak in that country and how they describe themselves, that it's worth pointing out. So just like I said with um, the United States, you cannot go on a um, travel insurance website in Hebrew and expect to find the transliteration of America and you'll be done if you go into the USA. You have to look up Arzotabrit. Okay, there are some other countries, particularly ones that um, we Jews and Israelis have long standing relations with or dealings with that have unique names that are going to be important. And um, again, I don't suppose that in um, Ulpan, if you're in that right now, they're teaching that, but if you're itching to go on a um, vacation this summer to Greece and you're looking for the word Greece, you're going to be in a lot of trouble because that is not how we say the country Greece in Hebrew. Instead, here are some of the big ones. Greece. Greece is Yavan. If you didn't know that already, in Hebrew, we say Yavan. Many of these words are going to have biblical origins. Um, Yavan is both found in the Bible, in the Tanakh, um, as one of the many descendants of Noah and his sons, and by extension daughters. Um, but Yavan is um, the name for Greece in modern Hebrew. Um, it has to do with the Ionian Sea, that eastern part of Greece, that's also the um, Turkish western uh, coast, which is one of the foundations of Greek civilization. Um, this term is also used in many other languages from our region. Um, we say Yavan in Hebrew, in Turkish, and in Arabic, they say Yunan, as well as in Persian and many other languages in the region. So this is something that's unique to us because we've been around this group of people for a very long time. So we don't say Greece in Hebrew. We say Yavan. Greek is Yavani. The Greek language is Yavanit, and that's all you're going to see. So if you are booking a vacation to Greece, this is what you're looking for, Yavan. And it's spelled just like this, Yud, Vav, Vav, Nun, Sophie. Okay, Yavan. Let's go to some others. Some of these will sound familiar, some of these won't, um, and some of these need a little bit more explanation. Uh, Sin. This one we see in a lot of other countries and other um, languages, rather, in referring to China. Sin is China. Um, this isn't getting into the geopolitics of the People's Republic of China or Taiwan. Whatever you want to use, it's Sin. Chinese is Sini. Chinese language, Sinit. Okay? Sin is China. Hodu. Hodu is another word that is in the Tanakh. When we talk about um, in the Megillat Esther, the scroll of Esther that we read on Purim, that... Um, Achashverosh's, King Achashverosh's kingdom stretched um, on one side from Mehodu, from what we use in modern Hebrew to indicate India. Okay, this is the word for India. You can hear a similarity with India and Hodu, all the understanding of the Indus River Valley, but just know Hodu, a very popular um, place for Israelis after their army service and in general to travel to is that Hodu is India, Indian is Hodi or Hodit, depending on what you're talking about, or Hodia. 
okay? So ochel hodi is Indian food, just in case actually I was thinking about what to eat tonight. Um, this is one of my favorites, not just because we just celebrated, this is one of my absolute favorites. How do we say Egypt in modern Hebrew? The same word we just used uh, almost a month ago sitting around the Seder table, Mitzrayim. The exact same word we used in the Tanakh, we used in modern Hebrew to describe um, the country of Egypt, Mitzrayim. Um, Mitzri, Mitzri is an Egyptian or Egyptian something. Mitzri, Mitzrit, Mitzria, all of those are the different adjectives that we talked about before. That's how we say Egyptian in various um, contexts. But just know Mitzrayim is the um, Hebrew word for Egypt. And even though our tradition, Jewish tradition, um, doesn't indicate a very positive name to this, right? It has the words metzar, a straight, and tsar, narrow within the word. This is what we use for it. So much so, the Arabic, the language that is currently spoken by the majority of people in Egypt, you know what they call them? Call their own country? Misr. It's the exact same word that we use for thousands of years, Mitzrayim. Okay, not the most positive of words when it was first used um, in the Tanakh, but we use it to the day to describe the modern country of Egypt. This is an important one, Gilmania. Why is this important? Because oftentimes we're going to get to one in a second that you're going to say, okay, well, we use this word to describe this country. Why don't we say Ashkenaz for Germany? It's a great question. Um, there is no one definitive answer. I would say the reason is that Germany's borders throughout time have changed quite dramatically. Remember the Holy Roman Empire, all those little German states. Um, and also Germany it has many different names in other languages. We say Germany in English. Other languages say Almania, referring to the Almanic tribes that came through during the Roman Empire. So Gilmania is more about the modern state of Germany, the modern country of Germany, rather than all of that ancient history. So in modern Hebrew, we simply say Gilmania. We do not say any of those other things, because basically because the borders have changed so much in Central Europe, um, Gilmania describes it well. Tzalfat. Here is one of our other ones, biblical in origin. Um, there was a lot of trying to understand both in Jewish commentary, but also in Christian commentary, when um, the Tanakh in Breshit in, the, in Genesis goes through all the descendants of Noah, of Noah, where are these places? Because they sound a lot like nation states that we knew back in biblical times from four or 5,000 years ago. Salfat was understood by many of these commentators, both Jewish and non-Jewish, to be the land that we now ascribe to the um, nation state of France. So much so that to this day, we call it the modern nation state, whatever republic, it's now called the fourth or fifth republic, Tzalfat, right? So Tzalfat is France, Tzalfati is a French person or a French thing, male, Tzalfatit is French language or a French object that is feminine, Tzalfatia is a French female um, woman, child, doesn't matter. Okay, so Tzalfat, the word originates from Tanakh, but we ascribe it to um, France. Same thing with this word, and this word is going to get tricky obvi for obvious reasons, or maybe not so obvious reasons for some of you. Svarad. Svarad is Spain, another word that is found in that same genealogy at the beginning of the Tanakh, and has been ascribed to what we now call the modern state of Spain or Kingdom of Spain, Svarad. Svarad is also where we get the term Sephardic in English, Svaradi in Hebrew. Um, so this gets a little tricky when you're talking about people and their um, identities. And so their context is gonna be important. Um, if you just called a man Svaradi, there needs to be a little more behind that. Are you talking about a Jew who comes from Svarad? Or are you talking about a Spanish person or a Spanish thing, right? An important distinguish there, but just know that the modern word, modern Hebrew word for Spain is Svarad. Okay, these are some of the big ones. We have a few more to go through that um, are also a little unique or tricky. This is one that's tricky. 
um, actually the next two. The UK, just like in English, and I can speak for my fellow Americans, because you have the United Kingdom, you have Great Britain, and you have England. Three different geopolitical distinctions, three different borders that most many countries get all jumbled up. Um, usually we're talking about the UK or Great Britain or England. We just confuse them all when they're three different things. Um, one of them has all of the others in it, and one of them only has one part of it in it. I'm not going to get into all that. You can look it up on your own. Just know that in Hebrew, just like I said before, Aratzotablit is what you're going to look for when you're looking for the USA on that drop-down list of menu of um, countries. The UK is tricky because it could say any three of these and mean the same place, even though you may not. It may list Hamam Lacha Meuchedet, literally the United Kingdom, Britannia, Great Britain, or simply Anglia, England, and all three of the, these are considered synonyms in Hebrew. That can be tricky because if you, again, know your UK geography, you know those are three different things. But for all intents and purposes in modern Hebrew, all three of these are used quite often. In fact, Britannia and Anglia are used probably the most and interchangeably, which again, they're not the same thing. Great Britain is not the same as England and vice versa. I'll let you get into that conversation. Just know that if you are looking at that drop down list of menus of countries because you are going, you're traveling there and you need to buy health insurance, or you are doing something for your company, or just in general, it's in Hebrew, these are the three that you're going to be placeholders for the UK in English. Another one that's an important distinction, the Netherlands. Okay, we have weaned ourselves off in English from saying Holland, because Holland is only one province of the ne Netherlands. In Hebrew, we have not done that. Holland still is the... Um, holder for the Netherlands. Even though Holland is one part of the Netherlands, Holland in Hebrew is the entire Netherlands. Okay, an important distinction. So all you're going to look for is Holland if you are going to Amsterdam or Rotterdam or The Hague or wherever it may be. Okay, even though those are all in different provinces. Schweiz, this one is just, it. this is how we say it. Schweiz is Switzerland. Some of these are just unique ways that we say them. Schweiz is Switzerland. Lita is Lithuania. Polin is Poland. We've been saying this for many, many hundreds of years. Um, Polin instead of Poland or anything else. Um, all three of these are unique names. This is an important one, especially when we're talking about um, 2022. Georgia, the country Georgia, not the state. Um, you're going to hear in Hebrew two different ways to say the country of Georgia. Remember in the Caucasus, not so far away from here, you're going to hear Gruzia and you're going to hear Georgia. Gruzia is the older name that we use here in Israel that comes from the Russian influence over the region. Remember Brita Moatzot, the USSR? Gruzia is how you say the country in Russian. And has to do with how they originally created that name. Whereas Georgia is the way that many Western and Central European countries created the name for Georgia. By the way, the actual name for Georgia in Georgian doesn't look like any of these or sounds like any of these. But just know there are two different ways. The, um, what's interesting here is that as opposed to we, the Israeli society and Hebrew speakers, um, evolving what, what we choose, um, in the early 2000s, the foreign ministry of Georgia actually actively turned to Israel and said, please stop using the term Gruzia and instead use the word Georgia, because Gruzia has the Russian hegemonic um, connotation to it. it. It implies that we're still part of Russia. We are not. We are an independent country with our own identity. Please, if you're not going to call us by our own endonym, the way we say Georgia in Georgian, call us Georgia. And so you're going to still hear both of these, particularly among Olim from the former Soviet Union. They're still going to say Gruzia. Um, and the term for someone from Georgia, Gruzimi, comes from that. Or you'll simply hear Georgia, which is the more modern, what they would like us to say instead. Georgia, Georgi is a Georgian. Georgia is the country of Georgia. 
Okay, so that's an interesting one where um, politics actually play into the name of it, not just because borders have changed or things like that, although a little bit with these. Now we're going to get into some city names. And again, there aren't many of these, thankfully, just like with the countries, there aren't a lot of these. But again, these are cities that we have a long history with. And as such, we say their names differently. So um, the first one, for example, is an important one. Amman, the capital of Jordan. Amman, you're going to hear the word Amman, but you're also going to hear Rabat Amon. Rabat Amon is the name, is the biblical name for the modern city of Amman. It's mentioned in Tanakh, in the Bible, Rabat Amon. Even to this day, if you're watching, um, excuse me, if you're watching weather forecasts of the region and they talk about the weather that's take, that's happening in Lebanon and Syria and Jordan and Egypt, which they do, certainly on Khan, the public broadcaster, but on some of the others, they're not going to necessarily say Amman. They're going to say Rabat Amon. It just goes to show how old our connection is to this area. Um, but they're going to say Rabat Amon without a blink. And you're expected to know that means Amman. Okay, another one, Damascus, Damasic. Okay, Damasic is Damascus. There are many more of these in the region. We're going to talk about a few more. But for example, also in um, Syria is the town of Aleppo. In Hebrew, we say Chalab. Um, it is also how they say it in Arabic. It's also because there was a long-standing Jewish community there. So that's just as important as Damasic, Chalab, many more like that. Another one, Kahil. Kahil is actually closer to the Arabic for Cairo than Cairo is to Arabic. But just know Kahil is how we say Cairo in Hebrew. Again, if you want to travel to Cairo, you are not going to type in the transliteration of Cairo. You're going to look for Kahil. Another one really popular this time of year, and frankly, in general, all times of the year, Atuna. Atuna, Athens, Bruxelles, Brussels, and Vienna, Vienna. There are many more I didn't add on here. There is Kafrisin, Cyprus. There's Kratim, Crete. Again, the closer they are to the land of Israel, the more we have a unique name for them, more than likely. Um, but these are the big ones that are important to know that when we're talking about Israel standing in the world and our connections and our travel to other places, you're going to see a lot of these pop up again and again. I'm going to stop here because we have a bunch of questions and we're getting to the top of the hour. So let me open up the Q&A here. Great question. Starting off by Wayne, is Eretz country? Great question. Eretz, let me write this down here. Second, here. If it let me do it in a bigger font, no. Okay, Eretz. Let me just make that bigger. Make all of these bigger just so that we can write some more words down here as needed. All right. So, Full screen. Eretz in modern Hebrew means land. Okay, when we say Ha'aretz, the land, we're referring to the land of Israel. Now, Aretzot Tabrit is an exception. It's the lands of the covenant, and you can understand it as that. Um, and again, this is turn of the century as Hebrew is being codified. Um, all these words, just like in English, get a little mixed up with each other. Land, country, nation, people. They're complicated um, ideas that each land, country, and people have a different idea of what they mean. Certainly, Jews and Israelis have a very different way of understanding all those things than other countries do. In modern Hebrew, it's going to be land. Okay, A state or a country, and that's also tricky, Medina. It's both a state right? Medina in Hebrew is both a state and a country. Medinat Israel, the state of Israel, 
but Medinot um, Ha'olam, the countries of the world, implied both states, republics, all the other things in there. Excuse me. So it's complicated, but just know Eretz in modern Hebrew is more land. Medina is the apparatus, the governmental apparatus around it, the borders, the, the non-natural things that indicate the separation of nations. Okay. Um, nation is, great question, is either Uma, so U, Uma, or Leom. Okay, two words that mean nation here. Let me pull up back to the top here. Leom with an O or Uma, Uma. Okay, Leom, Uma. Both of those words mean nation in modern Hebrew, in addition to all the other words. Elizabeth, how do you say something is American? Great question. Um, great question, Elizabeth. You will either say Americai or Americani. So you'll either hear the I at the end or they'll use, like we say American in English, the same thing, Americani. Okay, you'll hear this actually in a lot of other um, places. So for example, Mexican is Mexicani, right? For more modern places, we simply turn how they describe themselves into a cognate. So you'll hear many times Americani or Americai. Either one is okay. Lawrence, isn't the word for USA similar to health? Great question, Lawrence. And this is why we talk about in Hebrew why spelling is destiny. Brit, Brit is a covenant or a union. Briut with an Aleph in there is health. Two completely different words. And let me write them out just to make that case. And this is why pronunciation is really important in Hebrew and even more important is spelling. You can't mess up in, um, in spelling in Hebrew. We've talked about this before being a challenge to people who have issues with spelling, um, but it's really important to emphasize these things. I know that in some um, Jewish communities, we don't emphasize all the letters, certainly uniquely to one another. In modern Hebrew, it's really important. And let me just emphasize that by transliterating these two words. Brit, bri, ut. You can't mix these two up. They are two completely different words with two completely different shorashim, the, or the, the roots of the words. Brit means covenant union, or those of you who come from Ashkenazi backgrounds, Ibris. Okay, Briut is health. Okay, Brit, Briut. If you can't say Reish, Brit, Briut. Really important that you don't say it any differently than that. I'm not gonna even say it incorrectly, lest to confuse you all, but great question, Lawrence, thank you. Someone pointed out a um, typo in my presentation. Always love when that happens. Thank you for doing that. Ha'ichud ha'eropi. Ichud is masculine, eropi. Okay. Even teachers can make mistakes, folks, but thank you for that. Um, anonymous, that's just the word. Why is the nation, why is nation Leom? That's the word. Don't think of it as a Lamed added to it. It's just Leom. Leom or Uma both mean nation in modern Hebrew. Um, anonymous asks a great question that many, many, many people have tried to answer before. Why is India the same word as Turkey, the food in Hebrew? There's great um, historical things about the word for Turkey, the food, the, the poultry, um, the, the bird. I'm not going to go into that now, but many countries also call Turkey the animal after India. Really short answer. It's because people didn't know where it originated from. You can look it up on your own. But Hodu is also the word Talnegol Hodu is what we call a turkey, the food in Hebrew, the animal, the bird. Hodu means India on its own. Talnegol Hodu, Talnegol is a rooster. Hodu, Talnegol Hodu, 
Literally, an India chicken, an India rooster, is a turkey in Hebrew. Hodu is just short for Talnagol Hodu, lest anyone think the word is only Hodu. How do you distinguish between the state of Gilmania and a German woman? Context. As with everything in Hebrew, context is key. You will know very quickly if you're talking about the state of Germany versus a German woman. And yes, Gilmania can be both a German woman or the country Germany. Um, Sarai, what is the YouTube channel to find the vocab list? Just type in Cafe Ole or Nefesh Benefesh Sarai. You'll find all of our previous videos. Thank you for asking. Um, anonymous, what is a person from Switzerland called? Great question. Schweizari, both a person and an object from um, uh, Switzerland is Schweizari. If they're masculine, Schweizarit, if it's feminine. Okay. Anonymous. Wow, they're really interested in these nationalities, right? Let's go through some of these. How do you say a Polish, Lithuanian, Swiss man or woman? Okay, really fit quick, and then we're going to move on, Anonymous, but thank you for asking. Polish, Polani, Polania. Any of you who know um, in modern Hebrew and Israeli society, we have the joke, instead of saying the Jewish mother as the stereotype, we say the Polish mother, Ima Polania. Okay, so Polani, Polania refers to a person from Poland. Polani, Polanit refers to an object from Poland. Litai, Litait is both object or person from Lithuania. Swiss, I just said, Schweizari, Schweizarit. What about other countries in the UK? Um, if I didn't mention it here, not just to Andrew who's asking, what about the other countries in the UK? The only countries I mentioned here are names that are unique to Hebrew. Okay, so if I don't include it here, it doesn't, it means that we say it very similarly to that country. I didn't put Canada on here, Canada. Okay, I didn't put, um, uh, what else did I put on here? Belgium on here, it's Belgia. Many of the names will end with Ia at the end of it. Mexico, Mexico. Brazil, Brazil. Korea, Korea. Japan, Japan. Same thing with all the different constituents of the UK. If I didn't say it, it means that's how you say it. It's more or less um, in that native language. So Scotland, Scotland, Ireland, Ireland, and so forth. Northern Ireland, Svon Ireland, the north of Ireland. Okay. Um, Shira, when do you use Medina, Medina or Um or Uma? Great question. Like I said, it's complicated. Medina we use when we talk about modern nation states. Okay, modern nation states, we often always use the word Medina. Um or Leom, Uma or Leom have to do with nation in the um, identity, nationalism I, um, part of a nation state rather than its geographical and geopolitical borders. Okay. I'm going to keep going as I see a lot of questions. Andrew, what is the abbreviation for the USA in uh, Hebrew? I scrolled back to it here on the list, by the way. It's right here, row 21. Okay. Hola, um, why do I hear two ways to say Poland? Polin. Polin is the country of Poland in modern Hebrew. Polania is incorrect. It's just incorrect. It refers to a Polish woman or a feminine Polish thing. Okay. Um, Polin is how we say uh, Poland in modern Hebrew. Just like with all languages, folks, people are going to make mistakes, even their native speakers. So people will say Polania, they mean Polin when they're saying that in with regards to the country. We need to stop here. Um, to everyone who joined today. This um, lesson will be up on YouTube in the next one to two days. So if you didn't get to write all those vocabulary words down, you'll be able to go back through the lesson, take screenshots, old school pen and paper, excuse me, whatever you would like to get those vocab words down. If you'd just like to review it and all of our previous ones, you're, they'll all be up already on YouTube. 
Um, toda raba again. Thank you all so much. We'll see you again here next week for another lesson. If you have any ideas, requests for topics, as I said, please write to us at Nefesh Benefesh. Behitraot. See you all very soon.